I'm very glad to be here. Hello, Dima. Dima, the other guy, Pio Kunya. The other two, John Pio Kunya, the one that I did. Tara says he's very happy to have the opportunity to speak to you about the Dhamma here. Hello, the other two, John Pio Kunya, the one that I did. So he is interested in the practice. He wants to hear about the practice and he wants to discuss the practice with all of you. Because this is our life. Well, Without the practice, our mind can become full of unskillful um, thoughts and life can become very difficult for ourselves. So the retreat, the retreat, the retreat, the retreat, the retreat, So in this retreat, he's not even interested for you to have an insight. He just wants you to practice. That's all. To be interested in the process of practice. Yeah. So he's going to tell you a little bit about how he views practice. So the practice of the Dharma is, in fact, the practice of cultivating or increasing the good qualities in our mind. All of us have good qualities of mind. Um, in Burmese, they call Dharma mind. Basically, there are minds that are reasonable, that are balanced. Um, and the practice of sustaining these states of mind, of growing, cultivating these states of mind, learning how to have more of these states of mind, is called meditation. And the practice of meditation is something we do with our mind, is the work of the mind. <coughs> in the practice of meditation, there's two bits. The object bit of the practice and the mind bit of the practice. So, you have to understand what an object is and what the nature of an object is. So objects are to at least kind of the ball. Being an object means that whatever it is is being known, is being observed. The body are the cube. And to have that role of being something that is being observed or being known um, is its nature. That's its role. Hello, the atom is a young person who sees the atom. But the act of meditation is not done by the objects which are being known. The act of meditation is the act of using the mind to know. And in that mind that is acting to do the meditation, it's very important that those good qualities that we're talking about just now, that they're they're coexisting in that mind. So it's very important not to be trying to meditate in tandem with a mind that has greed or in tandem with a mind that is aversive or deluded. The most common um, unskillful partner 
in the act of meditation is greed. Yeah. So if you love a dosa mohani, I told me, in the I told that my mind no, I told me my God no. But whether it's greed or aversion or delusion, if any of it is present in our meditation, then we will find that um, we're not meditating very well. So what the, the greed or the aversion or, or the delusion is towards is actually the result. When we want a result or don't want this result or, or don't know what to do with this result. He says, as much as you know how to practice and as much as you apply yourself to the practice, that's how much you are already succeeding in every moment. So there is no future result to look for or to want. It's already here right now. That's why he's more important. In, he's more interested in the process of practice in every moment. When we understand that there is a process of cause and effect in motion, he says then we are interested in the moments which are causes and effects and we're not interested in any future result anymore because we can learn from this process. Yeah. So in every moment we understand that whatever we have done, the result is here now, and there's no need to hanker for anything more or less. So we just need to be practicing steadily. In the right way. In a skillful way. All of us have six sense doors, and through these six sense doors, we only have these six objects that we can possibly be aware of at any time. So, when we use these objects to develop Sati, Samadhi, and Panya. I hope everybody understands Pali. Do I have to say it in English as well? Yes? Everything's fine? Anybody want to put up their hand? Okay, I can use Pali. So when you use the objects to develop Sati, Samadhi, and Panya in the mind, that is the, that is the act of meditation, or practice meditation. Yeah, I'm totally that I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. Whether one is meditating or not, everybody experiences the six sense objects. But what happens to the mind that is experiencing the six sense objects, that differs in one who is meditating and one who is not. For one who is not meditating or has one who has not the right view, then because of the six sense objects, loba, dosa, and moha can arise. But for, pe- for meditators, we can use this, these six sense objects. And because we have some knowledge, we can use the six objects to try to develop Sati, Samadhi, and Panya in the mind. So knowledge, uh, yeah. So that basis, that knowledge is very important. So there has to be some, um, some knowledge, some general knowledge about meditation and the Dharma. So information so only in Yama to a Sinsana Le Mame. Information in Maluchi in Sinsana Mame, Loda Le Mame. Because when we have some of this basic knowledge, we're able to think about things in a reason, reasonable way or a skillful way. So we're able to use those six sense objects in a skillful way. So, but we pure in a Tinya, a Yeji that John Pure in. We pattern our Aturam as a Pinya Yipa. So he wants to know. Ex- 
talk about how important this basic knowledge is. In the practice of Vipassana, Panya is very important to help the practice to grow as well. So Vipassana you are just like a people, a people are both. First of all, the objective of Vipassana is the development of wisdom. So sorry, I don't know knowledge. I like Mama Ganga knowledge. I don't have me. We send that to my me. That my Mama Ganga is not like that. So to begin the practice of Vipassana, we also need just the basic second-hand knowledge. We need to be able to think about it and process it in the right way ourselves and apply it to the practice in order to develop more wisdom. So you've all heard of Sutta Maya Panya, Chinta Maya Panya, Bhavana Maya Panya. So, sorry. I've got to explain this. Okay. Please put up your hand if you don't ex- understand immediately. Yeah? Then I will uh, stop. So, to put it in simple words, uh, there is general knowledge or knowledge that is gained. That's the Sutta Maya Panya that you hear from someone or you read about it. Yep. It's second-hand knowledge. You take that and you process it in your own mind. And you, if it feels intuitive to you, if you're able to see it and think of it in a reasonable way, that's Chinta Maya Panya. Yep. And then you apply that to the practice of meditation. And then when you've practiced for some time, you'll find that you're able to understand something more. And that, that is called insight. The application of the first two kinds of knowledge leading to more experienced knowledge. knowledge oh, yes. So if that basic knowledge you have, the, that second-hand knowledge you have, if you receive the right kinds of second-hand knowledge, you're all able to think about things in, in a, a skillful way because you've got the right knowledge. In the same way, when you've experienced, you have some ex- experiential knowledge and it's the it also feeds back into being able to think about things in skillful ways and Hello. progress your practice. Hello. 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 So in the practice of meditation, actually that second-hand knowledge has a very important part, role to play. So we need to read a lot about the Dharma, we need to listen to the Dharma a lot, and we need to ask and discuss the Dharma. And that will help us to grow our knowledge so that we can think about things in ways that are skillful for us to progress our own practice. One of these kinds of second-hand knowledge that we get is the, the concept of right view. What is right view? It's when you take what is happening, there is a natural process in progression, and you take it to be just that, a natural process. Not a person or a being, but a process in motion. So as Seattle puts it so simply, when you can see that nature is nature, then because nature is Dhamma is nature and nature is Dhamma, then your practice also becomes Dhamma or natural. So any object So whatever you experience, whatever you come across. Remember to see it through the glass of understanding that this is a natural process. Not my body, not my mind. So for the practice of vipassana, knowing, knowing, recognizing wrong view and right view is very important. When you're watching the mind and what it's doing, and when you think, why is my mind like this? My mind, immediately, everything becomes more complicated. 
difficult. But when you see it as a natural process, oh, there is this process of mind happening, then it feels more natural to also observe it. You're able to, ha- to bring a more what's a, a learning attitude to it, to observe it, to learn about it. So whatever you experience, he says, you can either bring the, this view to it, um, that this is nature, nature is just nature, or the view that this is just an object, it is just being known. The concept of nature, Dhamma, he says, is the concept that this is actually a process of of cause and effect. It's happening on its own terms. Mm -hmm. So you have to watch yourself with this point of view. From this point of view. Now, the matter is that auto method of the di jang and diam. And we're going to practice sati patana, so we need to understand what sati is. Does everybody know sati patana? Mindfulness. Sati patana is the found, other foundations of mindfulness. So sati is mindfulness or awareness. Yeah. So the awareness is the bhava or bhava lo. Any example of jiva. So he wants to do a little demonstration with you, with yourselves as guinea pigs, to, so that the nature of mindfulness awareness is highlighted. Right now, you are seeing. You recognize that you're seeing. Yes? Does anyone say no? Put up your hand. Okay. Everybody knows. Sure. Seattle says, are you sure? When do you start recognizing that you're seeing? When he asked the question? Are we unanimous on that? Yes. That's what he wants to point out. So awareness or Dave? That's awareness. When you recognize. Awareness or Mamida. Mamida about the Baba Mamida. When you recognize the experience, that nature. You remember, actually, to notice it. This nature, that's mindfulness. We have our eyes open, but we don't recognize the process of sight happening. It's because we're full of delusion. <laughs> So awareness of Mamida, the other ball, the Bawa Diago, not the other ball, the Gensi that Bawa Diago Mamida, the awareness look, the D look. So that's what awareness is. Awareness is the remembrance of the processes that are happening naturally within ourselves, within our minds and our bodies. So knowing our own sense, recognizing our own sense, Processes, our hearing, our seeing, our touch, you know, touching, thinking, other mind processes, recognizing them, remembering them, is meditation. So, so how much energy did you need to exert to recognize that you are seeing? Zero. <laughs> so all you had to do was notice. You didn't even have to put in any more than that. Yes? Yeah. If you understand this, he says, then you can start just taking in everything. You, you can be aware of your... So Alice, so it's not having to put in, not exerting any energy, not having to focus or do something. And because you're not doing something, 
if you sustain that noticing all day long, you won't get very tired. The yogi doesn't have to do much, he says, but he has to talk a lot to get the yogi to understand that. <laughs> If the yogi doesn't understand the nature of mindfulness, then the yogi cannot apply that to his practice. Then there are always hiccups in practice. Up down. Because vipassana is the work of wisdom, we need to apply some of our own wisdom, what we already have, to the practice. So if we're not even able to think about the theory um, clearly, then we find it also difficult to apply it in practice. <laughs> he says yogis come and say to him, um, you're always saying, watch the mind, watch the mind, or what's happening in your mind, but I can't, I can't see the mind. But that's because they don't understand the mind. They're looking for something special, something different, and so they don't find it because they don't understand the nature of what is just mind. In our lives, we use the mind all the time. That's how we function, that's how we live, that's how we do everything. But when we don't understand that it is mind, then we are not able to recognize that there is mind at work. So when we understand what mind is, and what, is the, what the nature of mind is, then we suddenly realize or recognize, oh, this is mind, that is mind. So, For example, all of us think. The mind is thinking. So thinking is the mind. But when yogis recognize thinking mind, they get irritated. But in fact, he says, we are practicing so that we know what's happening. And now we see the mind. It's thinking. Why are we annoyed? And that's because of wrong view or wrong understanding, wrong knowledge. So thinking is mind, paying attention is mind, noticing is mind. Feeling is mind, being aware is mind. We use these every day, all the time. If we recognize that we are doing this, we are recognizing the mind. You want to do this or do that, that's the mind wanting to do. Can you now just see what the difference is between seeing and looking at something. Can you look at something now? Maybe look at Siado? Mm -hmm. Do you know that you're looking at Siado? Yes? I have to say good deal. And that thing that is looking is the mind. Looking and listening. Look. And now pay attention to the function to do it. All of them have the same function. Looking, listening, paying attention. It's a similar movement of mind. Where so there, is, there, there are different sense doors. Looking is through the eyes. Listening is through the ears. Paying attention is with the mind. But they all have the same function. They bring attention to something you want to pay attention to. So when you pay attention or are being aware, can you not then recognize that you are being aware? Yes? Yeah. And, 
And when you understand something, like now you nod your head in understanding, can you recognize that there is understanding and that is the mind that is understanding? So, the Gelu Namale de Ayongo Vesava, Ayongo Vesalu Yava. If it's hard for you or any of you to just um, observe the mind like that or recognize the mind all the time like that, he says it's okay, you can take other objects as well. Anything that's being known is an object anyway. When the awareness becomes continuous, it feels like there's a, a, a train of something that's doing this, this awareness, this noticing. And then you can notice that quality at work as well when it's more continuous. So in this practice, in Siyadra says, continuity is very, very important. It's essential. That's why he's taken away the timetable for this retreat. Because he wants you to practice continually all the time, regardless of what you're doing. If there's a timetable, the habit is to do a session and then finish. So we sort of drop our mind. It's like, phew, <laughs> before <laughs> reloading. So he doesn't want any of this reloading and unloading. He wants you to just keep going. <laughs> so, but as he explained just now, he's not asking you to do anything very tiring, so it shouldn't be very difficult to sustain this, just this noticing of your processes and carrying on. So just every moment is a moment of dharma, is a moment of mindfulness. So another element of practice is effort. It's called effort, but Siyadra prefers the word perseverance. In Pali, it's called virya. And Siyadra says virya is better understood in English using the word perseverance or persistence. It's not so much an effort. It's actually a sustaining. So just that little noticing and keep, keep on going. So my Rolex Piyami, so I think I like Rolex Piyami, turn off that Piyami, now sing when I'm with you, be a man and love me. So, so you just have to relax, but you need to be interested, and then the mind has to work continuously. So, Nyanga, you know, interest, and Nyanga, I'm not interested in the world, but teaching is the same. He talked about wisdom, how we need to bring wisdom to the practice, and he says interest is a kind of wisdom at work. Because when we're interested, we're curious. When we're curious, we want to know. And that brings light to our experience. <laughs> but he wants that there is, there needs to be a simplicity in the curiosity. If we want to know too much, which means we're already looking for a result, and not just interested in the experience, that also can lead to problems. Now, Tamadi are the stability of your life. It's suicide of your life. And Samadhi, another element of the practice, often translated as concentration. But Samadhi is, in fact, just a, a state of mind which is stable. So, stability of mind. Not concentrating, yeah, just steady mind. And what brings about this steadiness is, again, right view. No, concentration is not what brings the steadiness. It's right view that brings steadiness of mind. You'll notice that the moment the mind has some unskillful way of relating to its experience, it falls off balance. 
Yep. It loses its samadhi when it has an unskillful response to the experience. For example, he says, a yogi was sitting in meditation and he was aware, he was calm, and it felt like the arm disappeared and the yogi panicked. So the mind was, got off balance. And why did he panic? Because he didn't have the right information. So he didn't have the wisdom to know what this experience was. So it upset the balance of the mind. So of course his mind was not calm anymore. So when we have wrong view or wrong understanding, our sama- we will not have a steady mind. And the fourth element is sadha or faith or interest. And the faith the faith that we need is Faith in ourselves, faith in the practice. And when we have practiced and we see for ourselves the benefits of the practice or um, how practicing in the right way helps, we will have more faith. Mm-hmm. So the practice feeds on itself. And the last element is wisdom. So he spoke about it just now. Basically, we have to have some wisdom to begin with. We have to apply our wisdom. We will gain new wisdoms. And then it will feed back into the cycle. How love you. <laughs> so we need to have the curiosity. We need to have the right view and the interest to bring to the practice. Yeah. Right view or not, everyone. No, we're not seeing everyone. The bawa, the bawa, the sensam. So you all understand right view, yes? Siada spoke about it just now. I know. Viewing nature as nature. So after that, I am. I say I'm low. Recognize low boy. The amyana low. I'm a tiny. So just babble low, no low. So no need to put too much effort into the practice. Just this recognizing of your experience and bringing that recognition with you through every movement, posture, and activity. I don't. The cool hell side below my low one. If your mind doesn't naturally stay on one experience, allow it to take in as many experiences as it is aware of. There is no requirement for the mind to settle on one experience only and stay sustained on that. Yes? All he's requiring is the awareness the noticing of some experience or the other. And so what you're trying to do is know what is happening. Recognize what's happening. You're not trying to not know it or know something else. Just know what you know. Good or bad, please know it. We, we are here to try to know your experience. You're here to know what is happening as it is. You're not trying to make yourself become calmer. You're not trying to make yourself happier. You've not come here to achieve anything. Whatever is happening to you has nothing to do with you actually. It's not your responsibility to take care of your experience. Good or bad, it's nothing to do with you. 
Everything you're experiencing in every moment is an accumulation of causes in a chain of past events and it has resulted in this now and the next now and the next now. So long as there is a causative agent, there will be a result now and you are not in charge. Yeah. All you can do is remember to think of you, the experience, as nature or an object. And then with some curiosity, observe what is happening. And if you can sustain that awareness as much as possible, that'll be good. That's the three kinds of yogi job. <laughs> yogi job, he says. <laughs> to have right view about experience. No? About the experience you have. To have the awareness of the experience. Awareness of and to maintain it. What is the yogi jobs? The three yogi jobs? Oh, yogi is not a yogi job. Yep. He says, Balapya. Yogi is not a yogi job. Yogi is not a yogi job. He says, Balapya. Yogi is not a yogi job. Yogis come to him and say, What else should I do, Siado? He says, There's nothing to do. Just carry on. Yeah? Have right view. Be aware. Maintain that awareness. Pavilo is not a yogi job. He says, Pavilo is not a yogi job. He says, Learning process is not a yogi job. He says, why do we have to do these three yogi jobs? He says, because vipassana is about learning. And until we've learned something, we just have to keep observing. Because it's the observation that leads to the learning. Mm. So whether you are lying down or walking or sitting or doing washing pots or ringing bells or whatever or staring into space um, your job is to do these three things and do remember to recognize your obscure senses like seeing <laughs> yes <laughs> He says, because he notices that when yogis close their eyes and practice meditation, a lot of problems come up. <laughs> because they start imagining things with their eyes closed. <laughs> so if you open your eyes, problems are all gone. Because there's only reality to see. <laughs> When we have our eyes closed, we sometimes think our bodies are becoming long and short and twisted and spinning. But if you open your eyes, it's just like this. Because what happens is the mind takes its sensory input and it puts, and it puts its own layer on it when your eyes are closed. And depending on what state of mind you have, you know, it might feel like it's spinning or twisting or long or short or whatever, or gigantic. But if you open your eyes, it's just like that. And, and we must actually know how to practice meditation with our eyes open. Then only the practice will be complete. <laughs> because some yogis say to Siaro, Siaro, I don't dare to open my eyes because when I open my eyes, I lose all my samadhi. So, so what sort of samadhi is that? That's not very stable if you just have to open your eyes to lose it all. <laughs> so if you open your eyes and don't have samadhi, then how to function in this world? So We want to develop sati samadhi panya all the time. And if we can't do it with our eyes open, very difficult. So daily life So how to practice in daily life if you can't function with your eyes open? 
Because you lose your samadhi. I mean, I don't know, but the other one, I mean, I don't know, 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 I don't know. There's so much dhamma in the act of seeing, just as there is with everything else. You know, who is seeing, what is seeing, what is the process of seeing? Is there a being who's seeing? Actually, seeing is just a process. Hearing is just a process. There is not a person that's doing it. Seeing is a process. Seeing is Dhamma. Hearing is the same, and so are all the others. He says, but we never pay attention to it to discover the Dhamma nature of all our processes. In all our sense contexts, seeing, hearing, very often what we're generating is unskillful mind states towards seeing, hearing, and so on. So in order not to be generating those unskillful states every time we see, hear, and so on, we have to practice with those states of being in order to develop actually sati samadhi panya about these processes, recognizing these processes with the right view. How many times do you look in a day? How many times do you know you are looking in a day? Because we're so busy being aware of the body, we are not skillful at noticing every other varied experience that we have. If we recognize mind and its movements and how mind is moving things, then he says, the recognition of looking and listening and all comes naturally because it is mind at work that directs us to look or mind listen. Activity, or. Mind. These are movements of mind or mental activities. So only when we have a more complete picture of our being, of all our processes, then our understanding, our wisdom will grow. So we do rising. So we do a lot of rising, falling, and defilements don't seem to arise. No unskillful states of mind arise, but we don't dare to look or listen in case unskillful states of mind arise. But then we never become skillful when looking and listening. So we need to practice. So the practice must cover all corners, aspects of our being, and um, and only then we will become skillful at using the practice in our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, Seattle is quite famous for getting people to talk when practicing, but he's not going to ask you to talk this week. He says... <laughs> But next week, he will tell you when you can talk. Okay? Mindfully. Mindfully, yes. <laughs> so when he says when to speak, then he will be requiring you to actually um, choose someone and speak with someone. He, he will give you a time to sit and actually mindfully talk to someone. And you must do it. <laughs> Um, but this week he says, please don't talk if it's not necessary, especially if it's unskillful, please don't speak. This week, anything that will jeopardize your sati samadhi opanya, your awareness, your stability of mind, or your wisdom, don't do it. 
This week is to help you gain momentum. Yeah. Momentum is so important for the practice. Yes. He says, he might even go so far as to say, it's only when you have momentum in the practice and it feels like the practice is doing itself. Do you know what I mean? It's doing, the mind is doing its own practice that vipassana begins. Hmm? So continuity, yeah. So continuity, please. No. In this continuity, it is not wrong to often check how you are feeling. No. Check your mind. And it is not wrong in this continuity to think about practice to think about how to apply practice because that helps the practice to think about should I do it this way or should I do it that way a little bit to help that hmm? what is the mind doing now is it aware is it not aware little thoughts that check your own practice to see whether you are practicing how you are practicing whether it's working Working. When you are thinking about your body or your mind, as in like, how is the pain here or what is this confusion like? When you are thinking about your body and mind, there is also awareness. Because at that time you have to pay attention to your experience to think about it, so awareness is present. <laughs> When there is pain, you're, you don't observe pain because you need to conquer it. You're not observing pain to make it go away. Meditation is not to cure pain or to relieve pain. You're watching it so that you understand the process of mind and body interacting when there's pain. So you're observing because you want to know what could I learn about my body and my, react, my mental reactions to pain and, and how they affect each other by observing it. That's the goal, to learn. So it's an investigation to learn and understand. Some, some yogis observe one object for a long, long, long time, but they don't, un- they don't understand anything about the object, just that they're observing it. And that's because of the, the mindset with which they observe. They're only observing because they want the mind to be quiet. They're not observing because they want to learn more. So why you're observing is very important. Your own motivation directs. <laughs> Yeah. For example, two fingers touching. And if, if the yogi just observes the touching sensation, that's all he'll know, maybe to calm the mind down. And if he's not willing to explore, there's so much more to know in these fingertips, but he won't discover it. There could be heat, pressure, intentions, all sorts of things. But if you don't explore, you won't know more. So, so that curiosity, the wanting to know what's this and what else is it, 
Yes, that's very important to bring into your practice. I know, I know. I'm a saya when it no no jaja shibu so that the same when zamu chima ya. So to practice without putting in too much effort, the key to it is interest. So it's it doesn't feel effortful because you're interested to watch. Why does the abdomen rise and fall? Those who already know the answer, please don't answer the question. <laughs> Why does the abdomen rise and fall? Well, rising, falling, and chila chala, really. Have you all done rising, falling in your practice? Many years, huh? Many years. <laughs> so why does it rise and fall? Pressure. Pressure. Why is there pressure? Yeah. Why is there this movement of air? <laughs> Intention to breathe. Yeah, breathe, hobby. Right. Breathe up. No, I think you So because of breathing, there is a rising and falling of the abdomen. Which comes first? Breathing or rising and falling? Together. Sorry? Together. Together. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 So you see. We observe a rising and falling, but we have to know more about it, a more complete picture. Curiosity. So many things to discover, if we'll allow us. The body and the mind are always interacting. The more we see these cause-effect interactions of mind and body, the clearer the understanding of anatta, um, I hesitate to use the word non-self, anatta becomes. No self is good? Yeah. 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 Okay, no. no Sorry. So, the last one, 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 the last <laughs> so, in the view, so during interviews then he'll say more and it'll be more tailored to, to, tailor to each person and if not then during the question and answer sessions you will also be able to ask more questions yeah? and you all have received a copy or taken a copy of Seattle's book please read the book as well so question and answer tomorrow or maybe change? Tomorrow is that course. And then uh, Monday morning okay. we'll come at the same time. Okay, yeah. So tomorrow we will begin group interviews in the afternoon and evening. And on Monday morning, same time, Seattle will do a question and answer. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah.